I like to go ahead and keep this informal. Uh, we've got only a few people here today and a few more that may be joining us a little bit later. Uh, so if at any time, uh, please go ahead and jump in with any questions that you may have or uh, try to put it in the chat. I've got an eye on my chat window, so I'll try to watch that or raise your hand. So we're going to be talking as a second part in a three-part series on decision-making. Uh, the last time we did it was two weeks ago, was focused a little bit more on the, the background, the general issues of decision-making. We're going to shift a little bit more into some alternate ways that some organizations are starting to approach decision-making, but put that in some context to understand what the differences are. And then we will follow up next week, where, or two weeks, yeah, next week, uh, we'll follow up next week with a little bit more to focus on how we actually do this. Uh, it, and we're putting it within the context of utocracy principles, operating style, and how to develop new ways of really leading organizations. Also, to put this in a little bit of context, there's been uh, some other previous webinars on decision making when I went back to look the one that was a week ago two weeks ago and then uh, back last fall we did a round table of open q a on different subjects within decision making and then as part of the global conference we did in 2020 we talked about design organizations that are built for change and as part of that we also got into some of the issues relative to quicker uh, better decision making when you start removing the hierarchy and the authorities associated with that rigid hierarchy. Going forward today, then, I'm going to be talking about some of the leading edge organizations, some organizations that are approaching the way they operate a little bit different and how they do decision making. And they're doing this without anarchy because a lot of the immediate fear is that when you distribute authority down into the organization or across the organization, that you lose the control. And that's not really the case. You don't necessarily lose control. You change the types of control from a hard control to a soft control. So we're going to be talking a little bit about that. We're also going to start to introduce some of the principles and operating style that talks then about how you actually do this, the guardrails and encouragement that the, the processes change. People need to be a little bit aware of those process changes, but also be encouraged because a lot of people will be asked to do decisions that they haven't been doing in the past and are probably a little fearful. Uh, we're going to introduce part of that this week and then focus more on that next week. Going into this, and we need to take a look at some of the different uh, decision categories because all decisions aren't the same. And there's a number of issues that we need to consider when we talk about alternate ways of doing decision making. Uh, the first is the magnitude of the problem being addressed and what would happen if the problem were to be unaddressed. Oftentimes, organizations are resistant to change. This goes back to designing organizations for control, not necessarily production of work, which requires routine adaptive change. So a lot of times the problems are put off until they become so major that they have to be addressed. So this gets into the really the the timing issue, as well as the, whether you're doing it proactively, reactively, and the amount of impact, often the impact would be the resources involved, primarily the budgetary resources, but also the time commitment that's required of people. We also then have to look at the controversy, the number of stakeholders that need to be in agreement. Sometimes organizations are very political. We have to recognize that. And that creates uh, some level of controversy and certain types of decisions that then have to be approached a little bit different. There's some different ways, obviously, of thinking about this uh, from alternate viewpoints, and we'll talk about that. Okay. Some decisions also require more expertise in specific areas. Sometimes that expertise is already within the uh, 
area that's being impacted. Other times it may be across the organization or possibly even external resources required to bring the necessary expertise uh, to the table. Then a growing issue is really how power is being distributed in the organization. Uh, Pre-COVID, this was starting to have some impact already. Uh, Post-COVID, it's actually even more of an impact that people are recognizing the need or the desire for flexibility in how they do their job. They're becoming uh, less tolerant of micromanagement and close management. And there's a lot of these issues coming to the forefront in the continue of work from home versus uh, work in the office and how those hybrid arrangements are arranged. But there's a, a broader trend underway of the expectations people have of work. And power starts to play here on who has the power to make which decisions and how those decisions impact others across the organization. We also then have to deal with some selection criteria in general. Oftentimes, change is, is done without a really good diagnostic. Oftentimes, they just do the first politically feasible solution. Is the a resource available? And this is the time and the money to do it. So too often, the choices made are not really thoughtful as much as they are political and feasible within the solution uh, possibilities within that area of the organization and what authority they already do have. This obviously is, has to be politically acceptable. And this is a cultural issue that starts to come into play when we talk about alternate ways of doing decision-making. We also then have to consider how the decisions align with other things, in particular, how it aligns with the mission or the purpose of the organization, the values that are in place, and possibly other strategies that are basically being developed or been in position for a while and need to be maintained or reinforced. Some decisions also require quicker actions. And some cultures then will do an analysis paralysis where they keep analyzing. And I ran into this uh, once and probably the, the reason why I left the company after uh, close to 30 years is that I was getting good reports. I was doing good work, good analysis, but none of my projects were accepted. They kept coming back with little minor changes because there's so much fear of making a wrong decision that they wanted to continue and continue and continue analyzing from different perspectives and they ended up missing opportunities because of that. So the decision criteria has to be somewhat simple, easily understood and implemented to stop that uh, analysis uh, cycle. There's also then the alignment with other requests, the synergy. And this comes up in a couple cases where sometimes there's too much to do. You can't do everything that's good. So you have to do some prioritization. One way to prioritize is see how it aligns with other requests. If it's an old request that is stale and not being re-requested by the original person who wanted or the organization that wanted it, then obviously that time has passed, there's not enough passion for it, or they found another solution to their problem. However, to the extent that you've got repeated recent requests that come across multiple customers or multiple suppliers, then there's a possibility there's some synergy, some force, some real interest, and that is a higher priority. Then, So it's not only in alignment with what you're doing currently, but it may be a realignment with the desires of your key partners or stakeholders uh, that will have some impact on your decision-making criteria. This is also one that comes up in uh, this reference, Rasef, of a bias for team happiness. And that is to think about the employees, where their personal agendas lie in alignment with the organization, what makes them happy, 
what do they enjoy doing to the extent that you align with them they will be more passionate they'll release their energies toward the implementation of the decision once uh, once made and this becomes a critical component and that the decision itself is immaterial unless it's actually acted on so to the extent that you have employees that are desired of it and are fully committed to it there's some there's something to be said there is a critical component then for selection criteria this then has addressed some of the different types of categories of decision and the selection criteria itself uh, any questions before we shift into different ways of decision making okay. let's talk about different decision making uh, this is a little bit of a repeat from two weeks ago uh, this is the traditional approach where one person is the decider. Now, obviously, there's input from others, but the key question is how does that input really attained? Sometimes they would like to tell people what to do. They realize that often does not work. So they resort then to selling once the decision is made. And to the extent that they are selling it, they're, they need to have a solid rationale that they can explain to others. This requires some input from others, which raises an interesting question of how do you answer a question? And I learned this actually almost accidentally very early in my career. Okay. The situation was I was making a presentation leading to an investment decision. I was a financial marketing analyst at the time, and I was presenting to the senior vice president of marketing, who was three levels in the organization above me. And I basically answered the question okay, as I thought it should have been ans answered. Okay, And afterwards, the manager two levels above me kind of gave me a little bit of a ribbing and made fun of me and my answer and that I was revealing too much in what I did, which kind of caught me by surprise because I was putting myself in the position of what the senior vice president would need to know to make the decision. And I was laying that out there. And when I was thinking about this, I came to the conclusion that there's three ways that people can answer a question. Okay. And I was being kidded about my answer, but at the same time, I was also receiving a cultural lesson of I need to be careful of how I answer questions in the future. Okay. The way that most people answer questions is from a political standpoint. They don't necessarily answer the question that was asked. They answer the question that they would like to answer. And politicians are masters at this. If you ever listen to a politician in a news conference, rarely will they ever answer the question that was asked. Even if a direct question, they will always divert to a, a tangent topic and talk about something that they would rather talk about. They answer a different question. So that's a political choice. And you also see this in many political organizations. Another safe way of answering a question is to specifically answer the question as it was asked. Okay, You've basically uh, performed your job. You provided the information that was asked in the form that it was asked. What I had done inadvertently, was I answered the question that should have been asked had the person known more about the topic. Okay, And this particular question, the vice president was asking more detail, but he didn't know enough that, that I already knew. So he really wasn't asking what he needed to know. So I answered the question he should have asked. asked. Okay. And that's what kind of got me into trouble because that is obviously quite a ways away from the political response that most people would have done. Okay. This then gets into how do you involve others beyond just asking questions? 
and the testing ideas and others and consulting options. These become the first four ways of involving people to the extent that you move higher uh, in the levels of involvement, particularly in the testing and consulting, you're more likely to get uh, better input, but also better commitment to the final result itself. The fifth option is we're going to be talking more about, and that is the team effort for decision-making. This is the co-creation where the people are brought into decision-making process itself. This is sometimes done through explicit delegation, though this can be limited because there's real challenges of empowerment. Oftentimes, people think of empowerment as what they are explicitly allowed to do versus thinking of empowerment as boundaries that must be tested as very different. The uh, better to ask for forgiveness than ask for permission is an approach of testing the boundaries. If you can do it within the organization's purpose and show it for the benefit of others and the organization and not a personal agenda, then you're pretty safe even if you start to cross uh, that line. But most employees have been well-trained in a directive management style, in which case they don't test those boundaries. They only do explicit empowerment of what is delegated to them and they don't test other things. Okay, This also gets down to the ability to withhold such delegation and that there's always a threat that while it's being delegated now, it's not necessarily permanent and it raises a little bit of fear such that if you might worry about making a mistake, you're going to be a little bit more cautious in your choices, or you may choose to uh, bump it back into the organization. And this gets into a cycle then of managers often are overloaded. They want to delegate more, but at the same time, they're training their people not to make decisions and to bump the decisions back to them for resolution. The pushing down to the lowest level, Nucor Steel is an example of this. It's a very, very flat organization. There is a hierarchy nonetheless, but their attitude for decisions is that they're always made at the lowest level possible. To the extent that the organization is flat, that gives a lot of decision-making authority down because decisions are often made in a hierarchy at the points where different uh, stakeholders actually meet up the organization chart. So to the extent that it's a flat organization with a desire to push organization decisions down, Nucor is an example of giving more empowerment for decision-making lower in the organization. Okay. The issue of granting authority then comes in and that there's some fear involved here of if you give people options, will they do the same thing that you would have done and this is a fear act actions that needs to be addressed explicitly. And that there's a fear of delegating. And this, again, like I said, goes two ways. It's the fear of getting the decision that you would make. And to what extent is it really critical? You know, this gets into the 80-20 type of rule. Probably only 20% of the decisions are really critical that if someone were to make differently than you, would really be uh, worrisome or problematic. The other 80%, uh, probably multiple good options are suitable and there's no perfect option. Rarely is there ever a perfect option when you look at decision-making. This also then gets into can empowerment easily be, be withdrawn, which is really uh, bi-directional in that if you want to be a tight manager, and you delegate something, to what extent can you walk that back? That becomes a fear that prevents people from delegating in the first place. It also creates a situation that once you do that, it reinforces the ability of it. Is it really a delegation or is it a temporary situation? This gets into the fear of accepting that empowerment. 
Uh, if you make a mistake, will it be taken away from you? To what extent are mistakes um, basically punished? The risk then is worrying about wrong decisions and the wrong decisions could be both. You know, someone making a decision you would not have made, but is it critical or not? That's the question there. And what happens if the decision is reviewed as being, quote, wrong, but that judgment is made in hindsight? And that's often very worrisome because in a traditional organization of performance management systems, a lot of times the results are really evaluated in the future, looking back on, is it the right decision or not? But that shifts the time of when the decision was made versus the judgment of whether it was a right or wrong decision. It also gets into cultural issues of how decisions are tracked over time to recognize when the assumptions made were right or, or not, or whether the environment was actually changing. Okay. We then get into the requirements for team decision-making. What do we need to have in place to start to empower more people to do decisions across the organization? Okay. The first is, is the process known by the people who are involved? Okay. And this touches a number of points. It's how to give people voice in the decision-making process the selection criteria and the choices among the, uh, the possibilities. So the process itself has to be known, but also some understanding of how that process really works in, uh, in, in a relationship with a lot of other things that are going around in the organization. We like to think of being able to put little circles around uh, compartmentalized decisions, but rarely is that possible? We're always dealing with an open system that's impacted by many other things going on in the organization and in the outside environment uh, competitively. Okay. We also have to talk about the authority for action. Goes, this goes back to the categorization of decisions and the scope of commitment authority. Years ago, when I was in a very traditional organization, we had a formalized system of authority. It was actually called that system of authority. Anytime you change positions, your system of authority changed. How much you could commit the organization to was specified. <clears throat> How much you could actually sign for and the degree on whether you were the first or second signer on those types of issues and whether you can authorize the uh, the payments themselves. So there are multiple levels of authority and multiple checks and balances built within a very formalized system. <clears throat> if you start to delegate this, then you get into other issues of how do you basically keep some control without losing control without... Okay. I found this on the web for basically keep some control without losing control. Check it out. Sorry about that. <clears throat> uh, the issue then comes in, how do you keep some control with the, the really soft approaches that are built in within the guidelines, the policies, not the policies themselves, the procedures themselves, and really more elaborate uh, thinking about principle-driven uh, versus uh, management-driven uh, decision-making. We also then have to open up the issue of transparency for information that is needed. The traditional organization maintains power through information, and information is only pushed down as needed. If you push down in traditional organization decision-making authority, information availability must also pass with that so they can have access to what is needed. And this information is not only the detailed operations, but also information that backs up the strategy, that backs up the purpose, so that people can understand the context itself for how decisions are made. Without that context, 
the ability or even the raw data itself is insufficient. The context will provide some of the selection criteria among the choices. We also then have to directly address the issue of bi-directional trust, the fear of tele uh, delegation, someone else making a poor decision, uh, and how how decisions need to be looked at not as a mistake but as a learning opportunity. And this is this is easy to say, but oftentimes difficult to do in practice. And this gets into the principles themselves and how you reinforce the principles. And we'll talk more about that uh, next week. Okay. There's also then the fear of retribution of poor decisions. Again, this is a hindsight judgment. And to the extent that you are judging decisions in hindsight, then is it a learning decision or is it a true mistake? Okay. And oftentimes, if the decision would have made been made differently in hindsight, the question arises in, could it have been made differently? Did you miss something in the decision-making process or did you make the best decision at the time knowing what was capable of known at that particular time? This gets into, again, some of the trust issues, some of the cultural issues built around how people are treated. This then opens up a lot of other the the human relations uh, issues. We also then obviously need to talk about the competency to make the decisions, particularly if you start shifting from a very, very power controlled, high in the organization decision making to a delegated decision making process. The people who are now going to be called upon to make decisions haven't done that. They don't know the thinking process. They have not been uh, involved. I was extremely fortunate early in my career and that many of my positions were basically um, in support, very tight support of these key decision-making uh, people in the organization. So I was able to see their thought process, uh, saw how they argued, discussed, uh, challenged uh, each other. And that was very good learning. I wasn't part of it, but I was able to observe it. And this is part of learning the competency. There's also the confidence. Do you have the confidence that you can make a good decision? And oftentimes the fear of making the wrong decision reduces that confidence and people don't want to make uh, decisions. So the competency and the confidence then go hand in hand relative to enabling people to take upon the delegation of decision making. Okay, moving then is when you move to team decision making, the question comes, where do you involve people in this process? And this is an interesting question because a lot of times we think about decisions as the point in time when the decision is actually made. But this needs to be put into the context on what happens before that, and to some extent, even what happens after that. So first off is the problem of identification and clarification itself. Okay, Too often times change is put into an organization where the top of the organization or a small team of people do the problem identification analysis to clarify what the issue is. Okay, Now that is a sense-making operation that too often does not involve many people across the organization. So when decisions are made upon that foundation, there's some resistance that almost to be expected or increased change communication is required because you have to start to educate those people on what the change team or the top uh, managers have already gone through. So to the extent that people are involved in this level of sense-making then will establish the foundation for decision-making and later the implementation of that decision. Okay. We also then gets into the identification of options. The testing or uh, consulting starts to come in here. Do you have a small group of people put together the options and then test them on others? 
or do you open it to a wider consulting process on asking people for what they think the options are? Or do you really get into a total team effort to bring them totally to the table to come up with the options themselves? Okay, so again, different levels of involvement throughout the process leading up to the decision itself. The selection criteria. We'll talk a little bit more about this shortly. And that is what selection criteria will be brought to the table and how do we use those selections uh, options for filtering and then voice how do you bring people to the table for their concerns the differing viewpoints again to the extent that this is left out of the decision making process you're setting yourself up for change resistance later this often gets into a rule of thumb that for change, sometimes you have to go slow first to go fast later. If you go too fast during this series of steps, you're going to only slow down the change process because of resistance and you're going to have to backtrack to fill in these gaps. We then get into the choice process, how people are brought into making the choice itself. And this is really the end of the decision-making process but it leads right then into the change implementation because a decision without being implemented is worthless. So again, you have a whole series of steps here that can involve people and to the extent that you're bringing the, uh, the delegation of decision-making further into the organization or across the organization, there's multiple ways, multiple uh, times that this can be done. We then get into, if you start to then move for multiple decision makers, not a single person making a decision, regardless of how many people may be involved, but if multiple people actually are involved in making a decision, how is that done? Okay. We might say voting. And this comes up a lot of times when people are asked you know, in a group, how do we make a decision? Well, we vote. This could be a majority or super majority. Uh, I've seen this done in, in two circumstances. Uh, I've seen it done sometimes as a quick straw vote, just to kind of get a feeling for the, uh, the feel in the room, uh, not necessarily to make the decision itself, but to kind of get the feel of where people are in their thinking, the thought process. And again, it's just a, a straw vote at that time. Oftentimes, though, you will see this formalized, particularly in legal situations, where the situation requires uh, for some legal or regulatory a formal vote. So, for example, uh, board decisions oftentimes will, will require a formal vote. This sometimes, usually in a board situation, will be a majority vote, but in a change of bylaws, oftentimes it's a supermajority. And again, this is written in the uh, the organization's charter as to the voting requirements and what situation requires a vote. As a rule, though, other than a straw vote, I have rarely seen a voting uh, to be done other than as required legally. Okay. The next thought that people have is that you go for consensus. And to the extent that it's a single person making a decision, that is a consensus there. It's a consensus of one. But consensus is generally seen as a very low value choice. <clears throat> low value from two perspectives. One is it's very time consuming and is a poor return on time invested. But also it involves a lower common denominator consensus. And too often times, you end up with a result that nobody is really uh, excited about. And if nobody's excited about it, <clears throat> um, if nobody's excited about it, then you run into the issue of um, if, if they're not excited about it, even the person who championed it, are they going to be um, enough there to have their passion um, diluted down that they're not interested in continuing moving forward then into implementation. 
Um, so there's a number of issues there. The other issue then that comes up is the question on ranking the choices and the weighting of that. Um, I've seen this done in a couple cases. If you were to look at a college textbook on decision making, you will always see a very formalized ranking, weighting, uh, basically an expected value um, as an option. I cannot think of a single situation where this was formally done, where an actual matrix was put together, weighted, and the outcome of that process was used as a decision, uh, not one. On the other hand, though, I have seen this done informally on looking at the different selection criteria, figuring out which ones are binary and using that as a filter. And then also looking at the possible scenarios within those selection criteria. So that there is some informal weighting uh, I've also done this from a sensitivity analysis, looking at the different options. And are we looking at clusters of options? How close are the outcomes uh, based upon the selection criteria? In which case, uh, in one situation, we did a, a corporate strategy and our go-to-market possibilities were were 16 different options. We had actually 16 options. When you went through the selection criteria, then 14 of those options fell away for one reason or another, leaving two options. And at that point, the economics and all the other selection criteria were, were pretty much the same. And the choice was really made at that point based upon the passion and interest of the people. And that's what we went with. What were, what were people most interested in doing of those two options? But again, it was somewhat of a ranking process, but it was done very informally with some of the decision sensitivity then looking at the, at the different selection criteria. Uh, questions at this point before we shift into alternatives? Let's look then at some of the different alternatives of how teams can make decisions. We talked about consensus okay, before. Everyone agrees for a consensus. This is a very time-consuming process. It can also be very political because everyone has a veto power. So oftentimes, uh, decisions are very difficult. Uh, particularly if there's uh, any type of power imbalances or a dominant personality. Uh, a dominant personality can overtalk others. Uh, the power imbalance, if you bring in multiple levels of the organization uh, within the hierarchy, or even if you talk about the value chain, sometimes the value chain, uh, the organization creates some power imbalances of who is seen as a cost center versus who is seen as a revenue center. These gets into some interesting uh, situations that ignores that you need both. Okay. So again, it's a time consuming process that often results in very poor uh, outcomes uh, because you're trying to get everybody in agreement, compromises have to be made. To the extent that compromises are made, your chances of getting a really good solution uh, is minimized and the responsibility is diluted because nobody has real uh, real ownership. You know, if, it, if it's a hybrid type of product, who owns it? Because you've got people having ownership of parts of it. And to the extent that someone who came in as a champion and their idea was watered down, they may be seen as the champion exiting the decision 
but they may not be totally committed to it because it was no longer their original idea. It's changed and they're not as passionate about it as anymore. So the results then uh, can be diluted through the compromise as well as how people uh, see their ownership within the outcome. And sometimes no owner is the outcome itself. Okay. We then talk about explicit delegation and many flat organizations. I mentioned um, Nucor before uh, was basically doing this. They did explicit delegation. There's obviously some danger of that delegation being withdrawn, but it is pushed down into the organization. Uh, I'm going to put sociocracy here also. Sociocracy is somewhat of a networked organization, but it's a hierarchy of networks. Uh, each working group is a circle or a network, but there's a hierarchy of those. So it's it's not a hierarchy of boxes, which each, each box is a person. Sociocracy is a hierarchy of circles with groups of people. And the decision-making can be pushed down into that from the top into a circle into maybe a subcircle, so that there is some delegation, but it's an explicit delegation that gives the category and the magnitude associated with decisions capable of being made at that particular level. We then also talk about an entrepreneurial standpoint and a higher organization, which is a, a white goods, large white goods manufacturer in uh, China. Okay. They use an entrepreneurial or an effectuation driven approach to decision making in that it is a series of micro enterprises operating collectively. But each micro enterprise operates with its own PL and budget. Okay. So, to the extent that they can make decisions within that budget, there's an explicit capabilities that are built into that type of relationship. They have relationships within the organization with other microenterprises. They also have relationships with external partners to the extent that they have the resources and the people who are involved are within that network. They can make any decision uh, and oftentimes they do. So for example, if they don't like the IT or HR services they're getting from another microenterprise within hire, they can go external and hire for that, or they can actually charter and create a new HR microenterprise to serve their needs. So there's some built-in uh, competition, but it's within the ability of explicit authorization because they're operating as standalone microenterprises. So again, this is an, an entrepreneurial way of doing it. They do it with uh, basically transfer pricing. You can also do something similar to this with basically uh, a skunk works operation where you break a organization off, you move it to the side, you protect it from the rest of the organization so that it is able to operate with a separate budget, separate decision-making authority. But again, that authority is explicitly focused uh, for them to know their boundaries. So again, we now have the ability to do the consensus, explicit delegation or explicit delegation built within an entrepreneurial structure. People can also vote with their feet. Uh, Hire uh, actually uses this also, in which case if people think that they're in a situation where they don't like the people they're working with. They vote with their feet and they just go elsewhere. If they see that there's a new startup microenterprise uh, being organized, they can leave one microenterprise to join another. Uh, so they're able to then vote. Uh, Sun Hydraulics will do this. Uh, Valve and Software Development does this. Uh, Valve has their programmers on mobile desks. If they... Uh, don't like the team they're working on, or if they see an exciting new software project that interests them more, they just move their desk and join another team. So they're basically making decisions on work prioritization. If a project 
ends up with no people because no one's interested in it, obviously the decision is being made that that project's not being done. Another project may be uh, over-resourced and will be able to move forward at a quicker rate. So people are able to then easily prioritize work through the decisions they make on where they choose to work. Okay. We then get into more general decision-making, the routine decision-making of two options here. I'm gonna go into each of these in a little more detail. This is the consent process or the advice process. The consent is the opposite of consensus. In consensus, everybody has to agree. Okay. In consent, nobody disagrees. Okay. Flips that around. And the advice process is that you must solicit input for key decisions from the stakeholders who may be impacted. So, so let's go into these in a little bit more detail. The consent, nobody dissents. Okay. The decision itself is not made until everyone has voiced any dissent. And this is a critical component here in that dissent must be explained. Okay. If you choose not to express your thoughts, you lose the right to disagree with the decision itself because no dissent is assumed to be acceptance of that decision option. Okay. There's many different types of approaches to how to get that voice made. Uh, some, uh, like sociocracy, holacracy, may use a talking stick, in which case a physical stick or something is handed around the room and only the person with that object can speak and everyone else must listen without questioning until the speaker is done. So there is a built-in process that people have voice and they are also heard, but being heard doesn't necessarily mean that people agree with you. Okay. To the extent that people disagree with you, you may still have dissent, but the pressure is upon you to express that dissent to get other people to agree with you or to find out why your dissent is inaccurate. So there's a discussion process that continues until there is no dissent. Are you um, worn down? Do you finally agree that it's not that critical? Or are some compromises made to address the consent issues themselves? So the process can be time consuming. And the time consuming comes from uh, two perspectives. Uh, one perspective is that um, you have to have a team already built. The team has to understand the process itself, how they work, and to give people voice and not talk over them. So for this to be effective, then that team has had to have some, um, some experience working together. Uh, new team members coming in, uh, other team members leaving, create, changes the dynamics in the team, and some team building may be required then to get back into the groove of making these types of decisions to feel that you're not being judged, uh, to be able to be wrong, uh, to be um, fully open and knowing that you're being heard and the issues are not uh, personal but are focused on the decisions themselves. There's also then not only the team building requirement but the meeting time itself. To the extent that it's a controversial decision, the, um, the levels of dissent, the types of dissent can be numerous and can take some time to uh, sort out. There's also the need to clarify who should be there. These, uh, this gets into who are the stakeholders that are involved that may need to be involved during the implementation itself that may have the resources, the categorization issues of the decision making themselves. This then also gets into how sociocracy and holacracy sometimes tend to actually add some bureaucracy to the process. They have very rigid meeting requirements, documentation requirements. Uh, in one set of situation where a consulting company is advocating the sociocracy 
way of making decisions and running an organization. Their resource base had over 300 documents and videos for training, 300. Now, obviously in a few simple principles, you should be able to run a decision-making process to the extent that there is that much detail uh, that becomes worrisome of how do you bring people up that learning curve effectively, particularly if there's any type of turnover uh, in the organization. So again, these processes can be put in place, but there is some potential overhead to them. Uh, companies using this type of consent approach uh, is built into all sociocracy and holacracy. Morningstar uh, Tomato Manufacturing uh, uses this in their decision-making process. And Berjoch in um, the Netherlands, and I'll probably pronounce that wrong, forgive me, uh, they use this as their type of organization with a very, very flat, almost non-existent uh, organization itself. When you read Humanocracy by Hamill and um, uh, Zanani, they talk about this in some detail and you get the implication that they really push this as their preferred decision-making process. Very similar to consent is the advice process where you must solicit input from others, but all decisions are possible by anyone in the organization if, if such uh, advice has been solicited. Okay, uh, This is uh, rather extreme if you think about it, that any person can make any decision. Okay. AES, uh, Global Electric and Transmission Generation uh, Company, used this uh, in the past. Uh, they have since had a management turnover. A uh, new manager came in, did not understand this process, and basically changed it back to a traditional process. Um, FAVI, FAVI, uh, Sun Hydraulics, both use this also in that anybody in the organization can make any decision. Again, they must accept or seek advice from others, and they must include people with the expertise on the issue itself. The big issues then will require a wide net of advice seeking. And these companies have very, very few reasons for uh, termination, but making a decision by not seeking advice is one that if, that is a valid reason for termination. Okay, But what's interesting here is that they're under an obligation to seek advice, but they're not under an obligation to take that advice after serious consideration. Um, the question I have is what is active serious consideration? That becomes somewhat of a qualitative approach, but that also builds in maybe a little bit of personal risk that while you can do something, do you have the confidence to do it? And to the extent that you involve more people in the process will raise the confidence level. And this gets into the value of the advice process itself in that you have a change champion that is pushing the process. The change champion has to build a coalition of support through the process itself. Okay. And it requires a high degree of trust and even more trust than uh, the consent. And to some extent, it's almost built into the entrepreneurial approach we mentioned before with hire, and that there's an implicit delegation of authority that within that micro enterprise, they can make any decision itself, but to some extent, they're obligated to require some type of advice from others that may then also require the identification of available resources, not only uh, from them, their internal partners, but external partners. Uh, when you look at uh, Lelou's reinventing organization, he really advocates this uh, part. And what's interesting is you take a look at reinventing organizations versus uh, humanocracy. 
Uh, Humanocracy focuses on the consent version. Reinventing organizations focuses on the advice, but it really becomes um, somewhat two options that are similar and becomes a matter of choice. Uh, If you're moving if you're moving from a traditional organization to advice, that is a major, major uh, gut risk. Okay. And then it may be much easier to move to a consent version first before you move to advice or you uh, limit the advice to certain types of decisions or capabilities. For example, is it within your budget and ability to do without involving others? Uh, So there could be some different variations built in here. Let's talk about the benefits of both of these, because the benefits are very similar to both and that they bring people into the decision making process. It's really a community building by involving people itself. There's also somewhat of an act of humility in that you have to ask advice for people or you have some need for others to come in. You on the consent version you have to involve them to the point of figuring out where they dissent so you can uh, address their needs. You're somewhat subordinate to them on having to get everybody to eliminate any possible dissent Uh, or the ability and the advice to go out and ask for help and information. There's also then the cross-organization knowledge building, and this is enormous to the extent that people are brought into the decision-making process, they are in contact with many people that are across the organization. They learn all the different system connections, the things that often come up as unintended consequences of decisions that are not addressed because all the stakeholders were not involved. So you're building not only a better decision, but you're also building better people that know more about these interconnections across the organizations and how that uh, how everything works together as a whole. Uh, Too often people work in their silos. This totally uh, destroys a silo. A silo cannot operate within this process. We also then have better decisions that are implemented because people come with a more of a commitment. It draws that expertise and knowledge into decision And by involving the people, they take ownership. We also then have somewhat of of an activity in that it stimulates new initiatives and creativity. And one author actually said, this is the fun component. These are not... These are not boring activities. They're exciting. You're challenging each other. You're thinking differently. You're looking at new possibilities. You're learning. This then is the two plus two equals five type of component. And by bringing people in, it's a less lonely path. A lot of times when you move up an organization, there is a a built-in expectation that you become more knowledgeable when you're actually further away from what you need to know and it becomes very lonely. So that people that are lower in the organization, they feel that they have no voice, but the people that are moving up in the organization feel more isolated and fearful of making wrong decisions because it's expected of them. And there's also the possibility that as you move across the organization, you're gonna meet some interesting people. You're gonna learn uh, from them. There's also then, being better informed leaders. Okay, and this is kind of an interesting point in that by pushing the decision-making down into the organization and not being a part of the decision itself to the extent that they consult you for advice or if they involve you uh, for dissent purposes, you actually become more knowledgeable about what is happening in the organization. There's less filtered information. Uh, information is highly, highly filtered as it goes up the organization. Again, back to the three ways of ask, answering a question. Do you answer it by what the questioner should have asked, or do you answer it as asked, or as you would like them to know? Okay, again, this gives a deeper organization across the organization. 
we then then have the necessary for guidelines of how do you actually do this. And those guidelines and the soft controls, how to build tension in the organization, enablement and encouragement, this then will be the focus next week where we talk about how this starts to come together of principles in action. Okay. Any questions at this time? No, everything is uh, really well explained. Thank you so much. I okay. think, uh, yeah, one one part that uh, becomes obvious with this kind of uh, uh, process is the need for diversity also in your organization. Because if everybody thinks alike, uh, there's no need to go around asking yeah. for advice. Yeah. Uh, you know, this gets into an interesting discussion that I've been thinking about is that the diversity, equity, inclusion is becoming a, a major push in organizations, but it's being pushed as a, um, really as a staff support function. Hmm. It's not really being pushed as a more global mental model approach. Hmm. And to some extent, you're exactly right. To do this right, you need diversity of thinking. But the diversity of thinking is not simple um, protected classes or identity of people. It's the diversity of knowledge, experiences, uh, different ways of thinking, different ways of uh, working together. It, 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 it adds value to the core of what DEI is trying to get to without putting a formal procedure in place to mandate it. So mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of like a backdoor to me, though it's, it's much more efficient because it, it starts to get to the real, the real reason why you're doing DEI versus uh, you know, fixing errors. It gives more of a validity to it. You know, good point. We have a whole, whole discussion on that, though. <laughs>